Welcome to the Live and Dare podcast, your show with interviews and insights on meditation, personal growth, and consciousness. This podcast is brought to you by liveandare.com, and I'm your host, Giovanni Dinsman. This is episode number 17, and I'm interviewing Roy Belmeister, PhD, on the topics of willpower and the self. Roy is one of the world's most prolific and influential psychologists. He has published well over 700 scientific articles and more than 40 books. He is known for his work on the self, social rejection, belongingness, sexuality and self, sex differences, self-control, self-esteem, self-defeating behaviors, motivation, aggression, consciousness, and free will. In 2013, he received the highest award given by the Association for Psychological Science, the William James Fellow Award. Although Roy made his name with laboratory research, his recognition extends beyond the narrow confines of academia. In 2011, his book, uh, Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength, was a New York Times bestseller. He has appeared in many television shows and has been extensively quoted in journals and newspapers. Professor Baumeister, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. All right. Thanks for having me on. Wonderful. Um, let's start with the very basics. How would you define willpower? Well, willpower, uh, I mean, I would define it as the energy that is used for self-control and, uh, and for other psychological functions. You know, the, the term is not originally a scientific term. It comes from everyday conversation. And in our research, we resisted using it for a long time until we were really pretty sure that what we were finding was... Uh, was essentially the same as what people have been talking about for centuries. Uh, psychologists are always very hesitant to use uh, ordinary language in there because it comes with a lot of connotations and baggage. And uh, we'd often rather make up new terms at the at the cost of jargon, just so that we have a precise uh, precise definition. So I, mean, I think the idea comes, willpower comes as just feeling like you have a temptation which may be strong or weak, and so you have to have some power in yourself that's at least that strong to overcome it. Uh, our right. lab research started suggesting that uh, that, that self-control operated like a strength, that it, it would get tired after it was used. Also, you could uh, build it up by exercise. So uh, eventually, we did come around and use the term. I, I, the turning point in particular was that New York Times book that you mentioned, or, uh, uh, and my my co-author John Tierney, who, who uh, wrote for many years uh, for the Times and uh, continues to, to publish with other outlets, um, he he picked the willpower term because he said, "Well, we have to relate it to things that ordinary people understand." Right. And so, um, is willpower? What's the relationship between willpower and self-regulation, and willpower and self-discipline? Right. Self-control, self-discipline, self-regulation are all pretty similar terms, and I don't really make much of a distinction among them. Self-discipline might be a little narrower. Self-regulation, sometimes people use more broadly even to cover like how the body maintains a constant temperature, and that's not something I've ever uh, looked into or worked with. Um, but uh, self-control probably captures the idea most carefully in which you're you're using your mental powers to change your behavior uh, to change how you act to change you know, to change your thoughts change your feelings uh, resist temptations impulse control things like that um, so uh, willpower then would would be the energy that gets uh, that gets used in it and and we think it's tied into the body's basic energy supply. Uh, right. Right. And we, we'll, we'll get to that very soon um, uh, in the ego depletion um, theory. Uh, but before, I wanted to explore a little bit. In the beginning of your career, you were not focused on willpower. You were focused more on studying self-esteem. Um, what made you change your mind and focus more on willpower? Yes. Uh, yeah, self-esteem was really... <laughs> The first thing I studied, starting with my senior thesis at uh, Princeton that was on that, uh, at the time it was not a, a common word. People were just starting to toss it around and it sounded like something uh, something interesting. So self-esteem is your uh, how favorably you think of yourself. Um, 
So in, in early in my career, I studied a bunch of things, including sort of the difference between the public self and the private self. You know, it seems it's held up over the years. You care a lot more about what other people think of you than what you think of yourself. Uh, and indeed, now that we have more of an evolutionary framework, it's clear that that's what's important that to, to our ancestors, what other people thought of them was decisive for whether they would live or die or do well or poorly and who they would uh, mate with and how much food they would get. Um, so self-esteem as your private uh, view of yourself. Uh, I thought it was interesting when I got started uh, working on it, but over the years, it, 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 it disappointed it. You know, we, many of us uh, uh, thought self-esteem would be a, a psychological cure-all that, uh, that if we could boost people's self-esteem a lot, so their problems would go away. It was an honest mistake uh, because low self-esteem is correlated with lots of bad outcomes in life. Uh, but it turns out it's more a result than a cause. Uh, so uh, some of these study, uh, I mean, School children, we all want children to do better in school, right? And Americans in particular have always sought ways that students could uh, could learn better without having to do all that homework. And so it was a great idea. If we could boost their self-esteem, then they do well. And sure enough, when they first just check the correlations, yes, uh, uh, the children who were doing better in school had higher self-esteem. Uh, than the children who are doing badly. So I thought, oh, great. If we could just boost everybody's self-esteem, then everybody will do better in school. Only it didn't work that way. Again, the self-esteem is more a result than a cause. When they tracked people over time, uh, their self-esteem one year did not predict their grades the next year, but their grades one year did predict their self-esteem the next year. So again, self-esteem uh, is the outcome. And that unfortunately means that boosting people's self-esteem isn't going to make them better at math. I mean, you really have to do the math problems homework uh, if you want to master it. Mm -hmm. And and that's why we get to then self-control and willpower. That would that then be the cause of su success? Yes. Well, that's that's what I uh, when I finally gave up on self-esteem, and, and it's still interesting. Uh, and, and people with high and low self-esteem do differ in a variety of, of, of interesting ways. It's how they approach social life and whether they're willing to take chances, things like that. So it's it's still interesting, but it doesn't have the, the power to make life better, whereas self-control uh, really does. And they're just exactly where self-esteem failed when you track people over time. Self-control has been a tremendous success. You even have studies where they get the ratings of how good children's self-control is when they're 9, 10, 11 years old, ratings by their teachers, uh, that that will predict um, not only how well they do in school, but uh, how whether they're unemployed as adults and whether they smoke cigarettes and whether they get arrested, uh, how many friends they have, all sorts of uh, uh, long-term benefits. So uh, with self-esteem, or with self-control rather, there was the excitement that uh, we are getting not only to a really important psychological function to understand the self, but also a way that we can really make people's lives better. My advice to parents and teachers is, uh, and others has been for a while, forget about self-esteem, concentrate on self-control. That's the gift that we'll keep on giving. It's better for the young people and better for society as a whole. Right. And so when you talk about self-esteem, is that the same as self-belief or is it, is there some nuance there? What do you believe of yourself? I suppose you could talk about any beliefs about the self uh, as, uh, you know, not necessarily good or bad. Self-esteem has an evaluative dimension. So you might have a belief about uh, how tall you are. Um, or uh, whether you're you like this or that. Um, so you have a lot of information about yourself. Self-esteem is really the the evaluative dimension. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Um, now, in your book, you say that um, psychologists have figured out that intelligence and willpower these are the two key elements for success in any area of life. And while there is, there doesn't seem to be any predictable 
um, reliable way to permanently increase intelligence, that uh, there are, we know many ways to increase willpower. Uh, and yet you say that willpower is the least developed human virtue and the one that is most responsible for our failures. Why are we not paying more attention to willpower? Okay, uh, let me just make a couple of adjustments there to, to the claims. Uh, I, I, I won't say that those are the only two traits that matter, and, and there are many specific situations where, for example, being charming uh, might matter and so on. But, but in terms of what psychology has found in terms of traits that really make you more successful in life, in almost any, any walk of life, any undertaking, any sphere, <clears throat> and we have a lot more data about uh, intelligence and self-control to be the two. We have a lot more data about intelligence. We've been studying it for a long time. Um, and it's, it's not just the rocket scientists uh, who, do, who do better by being intelligent. The studies that, that even a janitor or a waitress or all those ordinary people, uh, when they're smarter, they do better uh, as a result of intelligence. So it, it really is a lovely trait. Um, we started studying intelligence uh, back in the late 1800s uh, as a way to uh, help bright poor people get a get an advantage. The, the army was early uh, interested in that because uh, they wanted to get the most out of its soldiers. And you know, back back then, and many poor boys grew up on the farm, uh, but you know they could give them a test and say, "Oh, actually, you're pretty smart. Uh, maybe we should." Uh, uh, use you for something more than cannon fodder. <coughs> um, so, uh, and in terms of uh, the, the least developed trait, well, I think in, in terms of daily life, people have developed their self-control to a fair degree. It's one thing that, that people complain about when they rate themselves. Um, uh, Marty Seligman and uh, Peterson and a few others put together a list of the, the character strengths that people have. And when they ask people which of these 24 are your best ones and which are your worst ones, self-control hardly ever shows up as one of the best and often shows up as, you know, that's my big weakness in life. So people think uh, they're poor at it. Actually, they're not so poor. I mean, yeah, we could all do better uh, if we had more self-control uh, because it does really contribute to success in a lot of ways. But I think it, it's a case where the glass is both half full and half empty. Um, exerting self-control to change yourself, to override your responses so you do what's better, especially do what's better in the long run rather than what you feel like right now. And this is something hardly any other animals have mastered at all. So in terms of evolution, humankind take, took a great leap forward. We're much better at self-control than they are. And yet compared to our ideals of what would make life uh, perfectly, uh, well, at least it's not gonna be perfect, but uh, in terms of which would make it much better, uh, people can see their, their failures and weaknesses have often contributed to that. And they say, oh, I wish I hadn't said that when I was angry, or I wish I hadn't uh, eaten that extra cake or drunk too much uh, that night or gotten into a fight or slept with the wrong person. Um, so yes, there are failures that we tend to focus on more uh, than, uh, than the successes, but the successes are real. So self-control is an important human trait and one that's, uh, uh, that does set our species apart from others. Uh, yes, right. we, we would like more. Yeah, so it seems that uh, people do have self-control, maybe more than they give themselves credit for, but still they, they credit that to being the reason why they, they fail or they don't do better um, you know, areas of life. Um, okay. It's one of those things you don't notice it that well when it's really working. Right. Right. Now, um, in a lot of um, self-help books out there and personal development blogs, uh, there's this idea that is becoming popular these days that willpower doesn't work. And some people say it's self-discipline myth. Right? They emphasize that, uh, look, willpower is a depleting uh, asset. It's a depleting. Uh, um, it's like a depleting battery, and you can never fully rely on willpower because at the end of the day, your environment will always uh, win over willpower. And so, what we need to do is to focus on tweaking our environment so that our environment helps us build habits, and then we don't need to exercise willpower. What do you think of these ideas? Okay. Um, 
some of them are good and some of them are flawed. Uh, the, the idea that you can rely heavily on willpower, well, it is a limited supply. It is something uh, that gets depleted that you can't always use it. On the other hand, there's very clear evidence that it does, does do a lot of good. Um, so relying on it exclusively, mainly, uh, and so on, yeah, it's better not to do that. One big change in my thinking in the last, last decade or so uh, is I've come to appreciate that the really success people who have good self-control, they use their willpower to form habits and form good habits and break bad habits. Now, that's thus not relying entirely on willpower. Uh, so uh, you don't, uh, let's say you want to exercise. I mean, exercise is good for you, right? Uh, well, first time you're going to do it, you got to use a lot of willpower to get yourself out there. Uh, and then you get tired and you have to push yourself to keep, keep running or whatever you're doing. So willpower is important. And to do that, to rely on willpower to keep the exercise program going, that's, there are going to be a lot of days when you don't feel like it and, and you, don't, you don't want to. So what the successful people do is they use their willpower to establish a habit uh, that <clears throat> every day at a certain time, it's time to exercise. Habits, by definition, don't require as much willpower. They don't have as much emotion. There's not as much mental effort. Uh, they're more or less automatic. And the human mind is designed to, to, to make things automatic, to form habits, to, to learn, so that initially what's difficult to do over time, you do it um, more automatically. And indeed, uh, successful athletes, they they develop the skill so it happens automatically the reason people choke under pressure this is in another line of my research they choke under pressure is because when it's really important they think oh i got to control it with my conscious mind when actually you've learned to do it automatically uh, with the unconscious mind and then the conscious mind interferes and throws it off uh, so you can't do the things that normally you can do automatically so the mind is set up that way presumably because willpower is expensive uh, nevertheless, it's really important to do. I had debates with, with my friend John Barge, who has devoted his, his wonderful career to showing how many things people can do automatically or un unconsciously. And one of the, the points I made uh, was, uh, well, uh, uh, so suppose you wanted to buy a car. And you said, well, a car is uh, just driven straight ahead 95% of the time. So I don't really need a steering wheel. Um, I'll pay 95% as much for a car without a steering wheel. But you'll be sorry, if, even if you only use the steering wheel 5% of the time, it's really important to help you get where you're going. And so I'd see the conscious unconscious balance, unconscious balance something like that. Um, this uh, setting up good habits and breaking bad habits, that does take willpower but it really pays off well in the, in the long run, you know, like with our exercise plan or like with getting your work done on time or uh, being nice to your, your partner. Um, use, you know, let the two parts of the mind work together rather than treating them as uh, in conflict, which is one of psychology's traditions going back to Freud. But uh, you know, ideally they work together. Um, so that, that, that's what I'd say. Uh, don't, don't live your life based on willpower because it is scarce and precious, uh, but you want to cultivate it as much as you can and then use it to, uh, uh, to form the habits, to alter the environment, to uh, altering the environment isn't enough. The, the environment has to set off automatic responses uh, in yourself. So you need to get those and many automatic responses like, oh, it's four o'clock, it's time to go jogging. Uh, that has to be established, and that's that's what you use willpower for. Right. So it seems that we need to both um, <coughs> develop willpower and also manage our willpower in a way that we we are not just spending it for things that could be automated behavior. Like if something can turn into an automated behavior, it will require less willpower over time. But even for that, we will need some willpower 
to set it up. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because because yeah, usually... breaking, breaking right. bad habits uh, really <laughs> makes things better in life, and that takes willpower. Right. Uh, so that that's the optimal use of it. Yeah. So that's been a, a disagreement that I've always had with that initial idea because. As you said, even building willpower, even building habits require willpower. Um, and you know the fact that willpower, uh, the fact that the environment may always win in the long term, that doesn't mean that willpower is not to be exercised. I mean, you go to the gym and you pull up weights and gravity will always win. <laughs> that doesn't mean the exercise is not meaningful. Yes, yes. And I think it's a bit unfair to say that the environment always wins. Uh, people have triumphed over the environment certainly again humankind far more than any other species all the other great apes sleep outdoors and they get wet when it rains you know <laughs> uh, whereas we have wonderful houses and hotels and uh, restaurants and, and and all sorts of things uh even just cooking food i mean animals like cook food when we cook it for them but they haven't been able to uh, create enough culture to uh, to develop that themselves and on the other hand, it seems that some things in our life for which we need willpower, we can never really automate. Uh, so for example, if we want to improve how we show up in a relationship with our partner, uh, we can create certain habits like um, sharing gratitude and appreciation. But um, there will always be moments where we need to respond to life in a dynamic way, like in the moment. And that's not a habit. It's just like we have to use our self-control in the moment to prevent anger from coming up or to, to manage what's happening. Yes, there's overwhelming evidence that good self-control really benefits relationships. Uh, when you're choosing a partner, if you wanna be happy in the long run, um, check out their self-control and pick someone with good self-control uh, that it's better everything for how they treat you and, and so on to uh, whether they're gonna save money or waste the family's finances and uh, um, whether they'll be loyal to you in hard times and, and everything else. Um, yes, uh, self-control is tremendously beneficial there. And so, um, you know, in the first part of your book, um, Willpower Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength, you um, make an analysis of willpower and culture. And it seems that the concept of willpower has really been out of fashion in the past century. But um, for me, at least, it seems that lately with the interest in things like fasting, cold shower, meditation, with the whole quantified self movement and the rise of positive psychology with their emphasis on character strengths, it seems that the interest in willpower, the emphasis on willpower is coming back. Do you, do you see it this way? Do you share this view? Well, I can't see. I, uh, I am on top of everything happening around the world right now. But uh, yes, I think there has been a greater uh, awareness uh, and a greater recognition. Uh, the 1800s in, in Western society were really believed in self-discipline and self-control and, uh, and all that. Um, life was hard and they needed strong character virtues to, uh, to deal with it. Into the 20th century, it became popular more uh, you know, believe it, achieve it, that you can just tell yourself. There was that Emil Cui fad in the 1920s where people would say, every day in every way I'm getting better and better. And they thought if you just said this over and over again to yourself, that that would do it. And you know, in, in a way, the self-esteem movement of the second half of the 20th century was a, a successor to that. You know, Just believe in yourself and have confidence in yourself and then anything great can happen and you'll, you'll be able. And it's just not true. Um, confidence in your help and yourself probably helps a bit, uh, but uh, but self control helps a lot more. And that's why I think uh, you know when I started doing the self control research in the in the nineties, uh, psychology didn't have much room for that sort of thing either. Certainly didn't have any idea any room for energy uh, models. They were, the thinking then was the human mind is like a computer and processes information. And so all the main theories were just uh, how do you process information? Uh, and we came along with this other, but fortunately uh, people have come around uh, in a big way. And I think there is a, a much greater recognition now that self-control 
again, it's good for the person, it's good for society. It's uh, you know, self-esteem, thinking well of yourself might have, it, it feels good for you. We found a, a few limited benefits that it has. Um, whether it's better for society, uh, say, especially high self-esteem, suppose you think you're great when you're not. Well, that creates difficulties in relationships because you think you're entitled to special treatment and your partner owes you more. Uh, and uh, in narcissism is sort of the ugly cousin of high self-esteem that's been on the rise. And that's destructive to society. Those people are more aggressive when someone doesn't respect them the way they think they should be respected. Um, Self-control restrains aggression and you obey the rules, obey the laws, respect other people. Uh, Self-esteem, maybe, maybe not. Uh, right. So, yeah. And so is there any um, correlation between self-esteem and willpower? Do people who believe themselves more, do they have stronger willpower? You know, I think there is. Uh, now we're talking often questionnaire measures and there's a tendency and this in, contributed to our mistake with self-esteem is for some people just to say that they're good on everything. You know, they give them good ratings and other people, there aren't that many people who are really negative about themselves who just say, I'm an awful person on everything, but some are more realistic and modest and humble and say, yeah, I'm, I'm not gorgeous. I'm not brilliant. I have a few good traits. Um, so, the correlations of self-esteem with other good things will be inflated by this tendency. Nonetheless, there, there are some real, and, and there should be, uh, if I'm right, that self-control is what enables you to be successful in life, then people with good self-control should be more successful. And as a result, they should have higher self-esteem. Uh, so I suspect there's, there's some positive contribution there, but again, it's not like, telling your children that they're great all the time is going to help them develop self-discipline. Right. It may, it may have the opposite effect. And I know many parents just sort of became reluctant to criticize their children and just tell them they're great all the time. It's not really effective for learning that way. You, you learn best when you get accurate feedback. You did this well, you did this badly. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the best for learning. So that may lead to, um, that type of parenting may lead to high self-esteem and high self-confidence, but not necessarily um, strong willpower. Yes. And again, narcissism, which is the, like I say, the ugly cousin of, of high self-esteem, uh, recent work suggests that that is increased by parents who just give positive feedback indiscriminately. I, and and the indiscriminately is, is important, but you know, the parents who just tell the kids they're doing great no matter what. If your kid really does something great, yes then by all means, you should recognize it. But if you've told the kid they're great all the time, tell, hearing it once more isn't gonna have, have much of an effect on them. Um, if you go back and I read a bunch of autobiographies by people who grew up in the 50s and there they had the opposite sense. They said, nothing I ever did was good enough for my parents and uh, you have this great thing at school and they'd say, well, we think you should do this all the time. And, um, it had the sense of, of never never being able to be good enough. And well, that's that's a bit sad. Uh, but I think the optimal would be in between there. Really lay it on and be happy when the kid actually does something great, but don't pretend the kid is great when uh, the performance is not. Right. Um, coming back a little bit to, to the idea of culture and willpower nowadays, it seems that an uh, almost universal problem for, for many people is digital distractions. Uh, most people, they spend uh, longer than they know they should on games, social media, news, um, and all sorts of things that the internet can provide. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there are all sorts of um, advice of changing your environment in the sense of deleting this app or installing this plugin that will block the social media sites, et cetera. But um, most people find that they find a way to work around their own self-imposed rules. So it seems that willpower is um, extremely necessary to, to fix this problem. Have you, have you seen any research correlating um, the amount of, or, or the way we use technology with, with willpower in general? 
No, uh, that would be uh, something well, well worth studying. Um, I would guess without, before I see any data, I would guess that the people with better self-control probably lose less time to those things. Uh, but uh, it, it's still, I mean, the, the, our, our work on ego depletion, when you use self-control, you're kind of temporarily using up this, this resource or using some, and then the, the body ships into a, 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 con, a conservation mode. So you don't want to waste it um, telling yourself not to play that game or not to check your email. Um, yes, setting up some, uh, some system uh, so that maybe you can't, can't get it. I mean, what we used to do is just only let new email come in once every hour and a half. So you don't, otherwise you see every time a message comes in and say, oh, I wonder what George is, uh, is up to today. And, and then you become more distractible. Um, and, you know, this distractibility thing, it's another reason why meditation is, is probably more important and more appealing today uh, than it has been in, uh, in a long time. Um, people really need it because the, the digital world which again is unprecedented. It's something in our evolutionary past, there was nothing like it. There was a, a lack of new information. You're living with the same people all your life and hearing the same stories. And there wasn't really much new to talk about. And now you can interact with somebody new every day of your life, in fact, 50 or hundred every day and, uh, and get new information. And, hear new stories and read new things. It's the modern environment is, is so different from the one we're evolved for that that creates difficulties. Self-control again, did not evolve to deal with this of the information overload, uh, but it is one of the few weapons we have to try to manage it. But this is a great case of w what you suggested earlier. Uh, you don't want to waste your willpower all day, every day denying yourself from looking at your email or something like this. Here you, it's really better use your willpower to set up your life so that you have time to concentrate and time to work on your things and uh, time not to be distracted. Right. Yeah, I'll be really curious to see if, um, because it is my experience and of many people that I've talked to that um, when you spend a lot of time um, on social media or news or games, um, it, it seems that that affects our willpower negatively. Assuming that you're just indulging, you're not resisting, you're just indulging, but uh, having your attention um, being used like this in small bits again and again, rather than long stretches of um, unbroken focus, that, that seems to affect our ability to exercise willpower on other areas of, of our lives, at least subjectively so. Um, any idea if, if there is a correlation there or if there are any studies that you know of? I don't, and I don't know why that would be um, from the kind of work my people have done. Um, if you're not exerting self-control at all and just sort of letting yourself be, be swept along, that should not deplete you. But there are two different things here. One is the depletion of your self-control resource. The other is the ability to sustain attention. And uh, um, Are they related? <clears throat> well, they could be, but uh, there also might be a much more basic thing uh, that the, the mind jumping around might be something at the more automatic level uh, that changes there. So, so it, might, it might be that the use of technology like this is training us to be less focused, but not necessarily have less willpower. Is that what you're saying? Uh, right. Um, yes, and you know, we watch television and it jumps to commercials, which are always trying to grab your attention. And uh, online, there are many other things to really focus on one thing and keep your mind on that. I don't know, I have to think that was probably easier for a farmer in the 1870s because that's what he did all day. Um, and not that much else was clamoring for his attention. Right. 
So um, deep focus on any task, um, I would assume that that involves an exercise of willpower. Yes. It, it, so, I mean, there's the natural tendency of the mind either to stay put or to jump around. And I think the modern environment is cultivating more the jump around uh, kind of mental state. Um, and then, you know, self-control sits above all these other things and it, it can be used to, to change yourself. That's what it is, the power to change your current uh, responses. So um, you can force yourself to concentrate on something, even if your mind wants to jump around. Uh, but it's it's hard, and the more your mind has been trained to jump around, the more <laughs> willpower you'll have to expand to maintain uh, focus. Right. I know you're uh, involved in the meditation field. Is there any sense that it's harder to train people to meditate than it was um, 50 or 100 years ago? It's just uh, anecdotal evidence you know, from, from teachers who have been doing this for many decades that uh, it's um, each time harder for get, to get people to focus on one thing for several seconds even. All right, well, that suggests, yeah, that the, cult the cultural is having changed. I mean, you'd think they would have the opposite impression just because as they become an experienced teacher, they would get better and better at it. And so it would be easier for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I suspect you're right that the people coming to them now uh, have much shorter uh, attention spans. Uh, I mean, we had a little girl um, I remember we had her at a museum once and some lady came up and said, what is that book? I've never seen a two-year-old child look at the same book for 20 minutes. And it was just some book about igneous rocks or something like that. But, uh, but we didn't give her sugar, which makes the mind jump around and we didn't watch much television. Uh, and so, you know, two of the big things that get kids started right away for the mind has to jump around. We, uh, she just didn't have that. And so she had a much better uh, attention span. Um, I imagine there are other things at work as well. So it might be that this um, new environment, this new technological environment is uh, building a habit in us to expect that for you know five seconds of attention to one thing, we should get some satisfaction, we should get some dopamine. And uh, when we're asked to focus for 20 minutes on a type of work and we're not getting any immediate dopamine, then uh, in, it requires willpower to continue to do that. Yes, um, I, I agree. I mean, I have a, the sense that my own mind has changed under the influence of the modern digital world. That you know, I tell my students when I developed my writing skills early in my career, I, I, I did have a computer, but I was cut off from the world. There was no internet. The room did not have a phone. I, I could not hear the doorbell. Uh, there was no one else to distract me. So I could really concentrate on what I was doing without any distractions for hours at a time. Uh, but nowadays, you know, there's always more information coming in and uh, everything's connected. And uh, so I have the sense that, that my own ability to concentrate uh, is, is not as good as it was during those, those young adult years. Right. Um... And so perhaps it would be a good time now to explore the idea of uh, ego depletion, the ego depletion model. Okay. Uh, in my understanding from reading a book uh, is that we have a limited amount of willpower and that it depletes throughout the day, depending on the level of glucose in our system. And whenever we make an effort, when, whenever we do a task that is cognitively taxing, such as making decisions, resisting temptations, etc., we are um, tapping into that pool of energy or power and we are depleting it. Is this a fair um, explanation of the model? Uh, yes. Um, it's initially when we did it, we, the first studies, you know, we found that after people exerted self-control on one task, then we give them a completely different self-control task. It should have been irrelevant, uh, but they did worse on the second compared to a control group who, who did a first task that didn't take self-control. So we thought, okay, well, maybe they've used up some of the energy and they don't have enough to do the second. We don't really think that anymore, especially after the glucose stuff started to come in because people say modern citizens in Western civilization certainly are under 
no danger of running out of glucose. So the body has plenty in its stores. Now, there's probably an evolutionary mechanism geared toward times that were much more uncertain. There was no guarantee you'd have food tomorrow. Um, also, there wasn't the medical care. Uh, glucose is used a lot by the immune system, uh, but, but very unevenly. So, you know, say you're healthy and happy and had a good night's sleep, your immune system isn't taking much glucose. But uh, if you've got some germs or got an infection, uh, then it has to leap into action. And you know, back then, people were uh, running with very little clothes, so running around barefoot or whatever. You've got a cut on your foot. That could kill you if it got infected, uh, unless your immune system was strong enough to fight the infection. There were no on antibiotics. So the body evolved to conserve its glucose. It's a bit like the way that we get fat now because... Uh, uh, our body was designed to conserve all the uh, uh, the calories it take, takes in uh, as much as possible uh, because we evolved under food scarcity and now there's food abundance. Um, so, so yes, it, it seems like the system is designed to conserve. You really have more willpower than you think. Um, so when people, it, it's a bit like physical tiredness and I've always found that a useful a useful model is people start to exercise and then their muscles will feel tired. But actually, if it's important, they can still exert full power uh, until there is a point when they get really tired and then the muscles just don't work anymore. Uh, but you feel tired long before that. It's, it's something that the brain kind of makes up a signal and says, yes, it's a signal to conserve your, your energy long before you're any danger of running out. Uh, and so the willpower depletion is, uh, ego depletion is, uh, is, is like that. And so in our studies, if we pay people to do better on the second task, they can do it, although then they do really a lot worse on the third task. Uh, but still, it, it's about allocating your body's limited energy. And, and, and glucose, the glucose has worked very well for us. Some other people don't get the same findings. Um, I know there's uh, various uh, disputes about it. Um, I don't think it's the, the whole story, but it's, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's clearly a part of it. When, when we deplete people, if we give them a dose of glucose, then they do well again. Mm. Um, it, uh, it sort of knocks out the uh, the signal of, of fatigue that's causing the body to conserve energy and glucose also you know it, all the all the organs in the body depend on on energy so you can't put too much into just your brain's use of self-control because you maybe got to redirect some to your your heart and your kidneys and the other other mm -hmm. organs that need to do it the brain is using energy all the time um so uh, but it uses more sometimes than others. Um, many of my colleagues are doing these brain scan research things and see what part of the brain, they call it, what part of the brain lights up, but that's some, a matter of their, their graph. Now, the light is a heat signature because more glucose has been used uh, in that part of the brain. <clears throat> and that shows then what part of the brain is active in response to uh, thinking about this or thinking about that or worrying or feeling anxiety or whatever they're studying okay and um so what i got a little confused when i when i read this and um maybe you can help me clarify um so i read that um meditation is really good for significantly the significantly reducing the blood glucose levels and that's why many promote it as a way to help treat diabetes so does that mean that it's draining our willpower no, um, although meditation as, as disciplining your mind to concentrate, it probably will take uh, some willpower. Um, my suspicion, uh, meditation is not that well understood scientifically and, and it has mm -hmm. remarkable powers to uh, help the mind and the body. Um, so uh, my guess is that people who meditate regularly, you'll get the exercise effect that their self-control will get better 
uh, at, at other things. Now, in terms of direct effect on the blood glucose, the thing about diabetes is uh, they often have high levels of glucose in the blood, but they're not able to process it, so it doesn't do them uh, any good. Um, in research <coughs> with, uh, with people who do not have diabetes, um, there's pretty good evidence that nutritionists had uh, documented all this before we came on the scene, uh, that when the blood sugar is low, uh, self-control tends to go bad. Mm. And uh, I think we even quoted in the book, there was a diabetic, a diabetic uh, comedian who talked about some of his uh, experiences when suddenly uh, um, his blood sugar gets really low and he can't make up his mind about anything. And, can't even decide what to do first. And um, he's rather funny about it. So it, it affects them too. But having high blood sugar does not really, does not really help them. Um, if meditation does actually reduce blood glucose, uh, well, that, uh, that could be, I don't know that it would treat the diabetes and there are two different kinds of diabetes too. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to treat it, but it would certainly help them avoid some of the harmful effects of having too high blood sugar for a long period of time. Mm. Because as a meditation teacher and practitioner, it seems to me that meditation is like a workout for your willpower and your focus also. So you, you're constantly um, training your self-awareness to notice when your mind has wandered and then training yeah. the willpower to bring it back to your object right. of focus. Yeah. Um, so I imagine several hours of meditation would leave you rather wiped out. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it seems that in general, you get more willpower. So I'm wondering yeah. if the, is it like the, you know, like you go to gym and let's say that your strength is X and then you pull a lot of weights and then you, you your muscles are depleted. Like sometimes you can barely lift a jar. But right. then after that, once it's healed and yeah. rested, then you get super compensation. Yes. Uh, we actually find the same thing with uh, uh, with the willpower. Um, that doing regular exercises uh, does make people better, even at things seemingly unrelated to the exercise. There are several meta analyses recently. Uh, other people have done um, a meta analysis combines the results of a large number of studies, uh, and they both concluded that the exercise does improve self control. And you, you can you can exercise on one thing, and it'll make you better at self-control in general. Mm -hmm. And I would think the same about fasting. People who practice fasting regularly, they say that it increases their willpower because, well, you're, you're trained to control a very basic urge. Uh, but at the same time, during fasting, I would imagine that your level of glucose in the body is really low. Uh, yes, I would imagine so. I mean, it's... Uh... We, we tried to work, you know, measuring glucose and, and so on. And we, we did that for a few years, but the body has lots of its own mechanisms. So uh, it might suddenly, when you're not having any food, if you're fasting, it might suddenly just go to its stores and retrieve a bunch of energy. So you'd see the, uh, the energy level or the glucose level go up again. Um, so there are plenty of things like that going on, but in general, mm -hmm. it's probably reasonable to assume that uh, you don't eat anything for a day. Uh, your glucose levels will be lower than if you mm -hmm. have three three big meals. Mm -hmm. And so, in that um, that famous experiment where people had those two plates of food, the cookies or the radish, and then after that they yes. had to to do a, a self control task. Uh, yep. So there are two groups of people. One of them um, could eat the cookies, and the other had to resist the cookies and eat the radish. And then people who had to resist the cookies, they performed more poorly in the self-control right. exercise. Right? Yes. But my, what I wonder is uh, if we get these two groups of people and say like, hey, for the next 100 days, you will always resist the, the cookies and you will eat whatever you want. After 100 days, does that group that has been resisting the cookies, have they increased their willpower because they've trained it more? Yes. Uh, yes. That's the kind of thing that, that, that works. Mm -hmm. okay. Probably isn't going to take 100 days. but. Uh, <laughs> But yes, uh, the one trick in that is what we were talking about earlier. Once you get into the habit of resisting cookies, then uh, it doesn't take willpower again. So in a sense, if you're going to do 100 days of self-control training, you want to keep changing the exercise 
Mm. Like we had one, uh, it was a meditative exercise where if you're right-handed, you open doors with your left hand, right? It makes you mindful all day. Uh, so we borrowed a bunch of those things. But uh, after a while, it becomes habit to open the door with your left hand. And then, it, then you're not exercising willpower anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so it, and I ask these questions because it seems that a lot of people have some uh, misguided conclusions about your research, uh, where they downplay the need for willpower because willpower is depleting, like a depleting battery. But I think that when we clarify like this, that it, it's like a muscle. So right after exercising it, yes, you have spent your energy and you're going to have less of it right after. But if you continue to exercise willpower in your daily life, the tendency is that you'll become better at it. Yes. Now, I don't know that it means you actually have more glucose in your body. Uh, so putting those together is a little mm. tricky, but you, you might learn better how to use it more efficiently. <clears throat> you might realize you have more than you, you think you have. Uh, so uh, there's some process there. But, but, but both effects have been clear in our, our work over and over again, uh, that uh, getting a dose of glucose does at least temporarily restore mm -hmm. your, your self-control performance. Um, and then exercise does, does improve. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a, a, a clear link with glucose, but at the same time, uh, it might be that you, um, you train your willpower and without significantly increasing the levels of glucose in your body, you still experience more willpower after s some type of training. Yes. Yes. More willpower or at least better self-control. Uh, as I so, said, you have more than you think you have. Right. And so it could be that you just learn that. And so the, mm -hmm. the brain doesn't start saying, oh, we better conserve energy, better not exert self-control anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that as rapidly. Right. Uh, and that, that actually would all, that'd be a very nice benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could there be other fuels for willpower other than glucose? Do we know any? Yes, yeah. I've, I've long been skeptical that, that glucose is the whole, the whole story. Um, the way psychology is we, these days you want to have some idea of what could be happening in the brain uh, to go with these things but uh yes there could be other fuels there could be other complicated things going on mm -hmm. um, anytime you're going between mind and body uh, <laughs> uh to get that nailed down scientifically is a very tall order mm -hmm. right right um so okay so so that's good so it seems that we need to both exercise the willpower to train it and also manage it, make sure that we don't waste it by making too many decisions, which is a point that you make over and over with many studies in your book, uh, the idea of decision fatigue. Um, so decision fatigue um, obviously depletes our willpower. Uh, is willpower fatigue and decision fatigue the same thing or are they different? Yes, so we used the decision fatigue. I mean, initially we started with self-control. And so willpower is a term associated with that and we didn't use the term later, but we did finally pick it up. Uh, and then when we realized that making decisions has the same kind of effect. So if you make a lot of decisions, that'll, that'll make your self-control worse right after. Right. <clears throat> uh, that's when I realized, okay, this is the same resources is more than, uh, than just a, a self-control research resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even at that point got into the, philosophical discussions about free will and things like that, because mm -hmm. what they talk about with free will is self-control and making rational decisions. So they didn't have any basis to say that these have some kind of common underlying mechanism, but that's what our research indicated, that uh, it's the same kind of energy and that using it on one will affect the other. So yeah, decision fatigue would be one form of ego depletion. So maybe, maybe you have spent like a couple of hours doing some heavy physical work, which doesn't involve decisions, uh, but you still have depleted your willpower because you have tapped into the same source. Right. That would still uh, probably affect your decision making after that. Mm -hmm. Now shifting gears a bit to talking about how we can. Uh, improve our willpower and, and the relationship between our mindset and beliefs and willpower. Um, people who seem to be very motivated to do something, they seem to have more willpower to do that thing. They are able to go through 
extreme challenges and to persevere despite uh, feeling weak, despite discouragement, despite a lot of things. Um, are there any studies on the relationship between motivation and willpower? Uh, yes, in fact, there was an attempt by a couple of researchers to say that the depletion effects were all about change in motivation, that after you did one task, you just lost your motivation to do well on the second task, and that's why we got the effects we got. <clears throat> if that part is not held up, um, nobody's been able to show a drop in motivation on the second task. And, you know, when they came up with that theory, I just want to know what's the right theory. I don't like from my theories. Uh, so we started including measures of motivation in, in all our studies for a while, but we never, never found anything there. Never, and, and it's a little puzzling because you'd almost think if it's like when you're deprived of water, you're more motivated to get a drink. <laughs> and so if you sort of depleted your willpower, you should be more motivated to um, at least take a break and, and rest and recover. Um, there were some findings that people are more motivated to eat high glucose foods then. Um, but maybe that's what the, the, the brain looks for. Um, nevertheless, motivation is important. It's a, it's a completely separate set of processes. Uh, so you can have high or low motivation and you can have high or low willpower. Uh, you'll probably be most successful if you have high on both. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, take someone who has pretty good self-control and uh, maybe a, a child and the parents send them to piano lessons and they don't like music and they don't like the piano teacher and they don't like what they're playing. Well, they're probably not going to do all that well. Uh, certainly compared to another child with the same amount of self-discipline who loves playing the piano and loves making music. So uh, they're somewhat separate processes and uh, um, Motivation, motivation is one of the most basic human psychological traits, not just human, but in any animal. It's the most closely tied to evolution that life has to con want to continue living. And so uh, nobody lives forever. You want to live as long as you can by trying to survive. And then you want to continue life by reproducing. So those are two of the most basic motivations uh, in the whole world. Um, of all creatures. Self-control is a much more, much later evolving process to override some of these others. And, you know, yes, you have an urge to have sex with people who might produce good offspring, but uh, your self-control says, well, no, I made a promise to someone else. I won't sleep with other people. Uh, you learn to override that, but that's again, fairly recent uh, and advanced. So an answer, I'm not sure quite where, where you wanted to go with your, your question, but uh, um, again, high motivation and high self-control uh, for best results. Right. So they, they are two separate processes. Uh, it's not clear yet how they are correlated, but ideally we want to have them both. Right. right. Yeah. Now, the final uh, point that I wanted to um, ask about willpower before we move on and talk about the self is um, how does our, our mindsets and our beliefs uh, affect our willpower? And I'm specifically um, thinking about uh, the research from Carol Dweck, that she has seen that people who believe that their willpower is limited, they tend to have less willpower than those who do not believe their willpower is limited. They, those tend to tap more into yeah, willpower. Yeah, remember when those came out, we were very interested in those findings. Uh, that you could sort of convince people they had unlimited willpower, uh, and we did we did uh, replicate those in a couple studies. So uh, I, I totally believe their effects, um, and we got them ourselves. Uh, we also found that when people were more substantially depleted, so most people use just a little bit of depletion, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. If we depleted people a lot more, then those beliefs in unlimited willpower backfired. Um, so there's clearly something right about what uh, Dweck and uh, 
Veronica Job and, and others are saying. Um, but there's some puzzles too. I mean, if it were true that just believing you have unlimited willpower will give you unlimited willpower. I suppose that were just generally true. Given the benefits of, of self-control, you'd think every religion and every culture and, and so on would have that belief. And they don't. So there is something, some reason to be suspicious about that. Um, so it, my, it might be that uh, believing, uh, believing that we have uh, unlimited willpower does not give us unlimited willpower, but it might, it might give us a boost. It might give us. It uh, might give us a boost. And again, I make the analogy to physical exercise, that uh, you know, if you're running a long race. At the start, if you believe you have unlimited willpower, when you first start to get tired, you might you might run faster and so on. But it, it probably doesn't really help in the long run and might even be counterproductive. Um, and especially if you run too fast in the early part of the race and don't save enough energy for the, the end, uh, you might end up, up doing worse. Uh, again, what limited data we have kind of point towards something like that. but. I, I, just to think with something this important and this powerful for making life better. Um, if, if that really were a, a general, a generally beneficial, then, then all the cultures and religions and philosophies and everything, everyone mm -hmm. would have uh, uh, already asserted that. And it's interesting because in in the Abrahamic religions, uh, especially in Christianity, there is um, kind of this idea that uh, that we are weak, that we are sinful beings, and therefore we need the help of, of God or, or someone to 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 help us and, and to to save us. But um, in the Buddhist and and Hindu tradition, um, they emphasize more willpower and the ability that we have to kind of control and overcome our negativity. So it seems to it seems that in those traditions there is a little bit more of this emphasis on um, you can tap into this and you can train this and it's considered one of the the highest virtues. Willpower is considered one of the highest virtues in those traditions. So it, it seems that it's um, it's an important piece of the puzzle, both the the actual biological energy for willpower and the way that we think about it seems to both affect its level, its levels. It's just not. It seems that it's not so clear about how. Or how much? Right. Uh, yes. Um, so these are interesting puzzles. Um, there, there. Somebody did a study in India and found that the ego depletion effect sort of went the other way. But and that's really unusual. Almost none of them go the other way. So that could be with this this cultural belief. Um, on the other hand, uh, India. What do you mean they went the other way? Oh, that uh, after the initial exercise, I think they did better on the second task. Um, and uh, I'd like to see that replicated and, and so on. But uh, but that's a really intriguing puzzle. Now, you'd think if that were true, or that, that, that India as a culture has had a superior understanding for how, how to maximize willpower and uh, uh, improve self-control, that it would be one of the most successful flourishing countries in, in the world it would have dominated everyone else. And it's, it's still considered a poor country. Um, it, so, seems they, it seems they did that for almost 10 centuries, but nowadays, yeah, historically speaking. Yeah. So it's, um, it's interesting because we, we, we cannot, um, so that I like your, your metaphor of uh, willpower more being like a muscle rather than a depleting battery. Because if the battery of my phone is depleting and it's, if it's at 10%, I cannot believe it to be at 100% and make it increase even 1%. It's not going to happen. Yes. But well, for willpower... Control, if it's down to 10%, you're, you're believing it is not going to get it back up there. But you, you can do more than you think you can. So you will think it's at 10% maybe when it's at 30 or 40 so do we have data suggesting that uh, if you are really low in self-control, you just cannot increase it by any other means than glucose? Uh, no, we don't. I mean, we can't really do that to people in the laboratory. 
<laughs> not not ethical anymore. Right. I would like to find some some sort of naturally occurring cases cases like this, but uh, you know, you look at people who are starving or something, then there's a lot of other stuff going on. Mm. Oh, if you want a volunteer to go to uh, through a five day fast and then test willpower, that will be that will be a fun experiment. I, I, oh. <laughs> I'll go for it. All right, well, that'd be good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, um, you told me that you're writing a book about the self. Can you tell us about the project and and why is that um, a question that is that is alive for you right now? Oh, well, that's something I've been working on my whole career. The, the book is finished. It'll be published later this year. Uh, 2021, uh, right around uh, uh, November, December, I suspect. Uh, so it's in production. Uh, but different parts of my career, I've looked at different aspects of the self. We mentioned self-esteem and self-control. I've looked at self-presentation and uh, uh, self-awareness, various other prospects of interpersonal roles. So. Um, and what is the self? How, how would you define the self? Yes, well, defining it is surprisingly difficult. It's a term everyone uses many times every day. And yet when you ask them, what exactly do you mean? People find it very difficult to say. Uh, in the book, I put up the question of what exactly is the self to the, to the final chapter, because I thought it's much easier to get from all the specifics to uh, a, a somewhat... Uh, a grand integrative point uh, than to start with something and people wouldn't wouldn't know what to do. But first of all, the, the human self is very unusual in nature. Uh, the other apes, our closest relatives, have a much more limited sense of who they are. It's mostly in the present. They don't extend into the past and future, don't have concepts of roles in society that they change. Uh, they don't self-regulate to uh, change themselves nearly as much. Um, so the human self has advanced very far in, in this evolutionary step. Now, the foundation of my thinking in the last 20 years is that all the traits that set us apart from other animals, are essentially the result of, of evolutionary adaptations to make culture possible. Culture is how our species solves the problems of survival and reproduction that every species has to solve one way or the other. Our solution is very unusual uh, to create culture as a shared system of uh, collective knowledge and interlocking roles and uh, cooperative enterprises and uh, economic trade and all that. Um, it's tremendously successful. Our population continues to go up, whereas certainly all the other mammal populations are declining. Um, so I would understand the self in that context. The self takes shape. It's not the brain doesn't need a self, the brain by itself, uh, a solitary brain. Rather, to be part of a human social system, the brain has to learn that. So essentially, the self comes into being as the brain learns to operate roles in the social system. Because these social systems are what produced a lot more resources, uh, and enabled us <coughs> to, to live longer and better and uh, more of us. So the, se the self is not a thing. You know, some people think, oh, there should be some little piece of the brain that you could take it out and say, this is yourself and I'll stick it in another body and then you'll be that person or that person will be you. And that doesn't seem to be true at all. And some, some of the brain people are saying, oh, the self is an illusion. I can't really find it in here. Uh, but they may come back around to the self when they think of it as interlocking systems to process the roles, and process the demands of the environment, and dictate uh, the right uh, the response to you know, how to perform a role. If, you know, you as a, uh, a teacher and a consultant, uh, me as a professor and a researcher, and so on. You you have a lot of skills. Um, and, you know, we all need food and shelter to survive, but I don't get my food from nature. I get it from the store, <laughs> from the restaurant, because I'm participating in this system and we have very specialized roles. Well, the, the self has to understand this, has to understand um, you know, moral aspects that if I, if you and I work together, 
uh, to get some reward. And then I, I just hog it myself, which is what any chimpanzee would do. Um, but I have to understand that then you won't cooperate with me in the future. And you'll also tell other people in my social group and then I might starve. And so you have to project into the future and use that to alter the present. Uh, that's highly adaptive moral thinking, economic. I mean, you, you can't have an economy without selves. There's no point in buying and selling uh, <laughs> uh, without uh, without a self to, to own uh, what you bought. Um, so all these systems make our lives much better. And the, the self is basically the interface between the animal body, because we are animals. We're more than animals, but we are we are animals. We are born, we die, we get sick, we eat food, we sleep, uh, uh, all these other things. We are animals. And so the self is what connects the animal body to the social system, which is what enables it to live better. So in a way, from this point of view, the self is a social construct, something that comes up after some years living in a, in relation to other people. Um, Yes, well, it's also the powers of the brain to enable it to do that. Uh, when we've been talking about willpower, that's an important part of the self. Uh, somehow the human system evolved to put some of the ener body's energy into these advanced psychological processes. Uh, so you can resist your short-term temptations to do what's best in the long run and to maintain good relationships. Um, right. And so what can we do other than uh, understanding from the theoretical point of view, like what can we do in our, in our personal lives with that information? Can we change the self? Can we, is the self malleable? Can we, is it just a collection of thoughts that we have about ourself? No, the thoughts we have about ourself, you see, that's like saying a map of France is the same thing as France. Uh, um, it's probably a little more integrated than that. Our, our, our understanding about ourself is understanding about something that is real, uh, but the whole system that's the self, and, and system is a good word, um, includes the information it has about itself. So, so like yesterday I was out skiing and uh, I have beliefs about my abilities <laughs> and what I want to do. And, and so some of the hills are marked with the, the black triangle, black diamond there. And I, no, those are not for me. So my knowledge about myself enables me to avoid those and stay on the ones where I can have a nice time and uh, cruise comfortably rather than uh, falling head over heels and uh, being, being frustrated. Um, so your knowledge about yourself or your beliefs about yourself, some of which are wrong, uh, your beliefs about yourself do inform your behavior. Uh, or we have an agent inside that makes decisions that chooses behavior. Am I going to go this way or that way? Uh, and that includes the self-control uh, part. It draws on information it has about the self, but uh, the concept of the self is, is, is not the same thing as the self. Right. right. Um, is there any question that I should have asked and I didn't? Any any place where this conversation could have gone that would have been interesting and I just didn't ask? Um, I'm, it's been a lovely conversation. I'm sure there are other things we could have talked about, but uh, I, I think this, uh, this was pretty good and uh, I hope, hope you're satisfied with it. If there's still something on your mind, go ahead. But Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think it um, helped. Um, clarify a lot of the ideas and misunderstandings around willpower and around your research out there. Um, it helped me as well to just clarify some of my own curiosities about uh, where is science in terms of willpower, how it works, how to increase it, etc. And uh, also all the areas that we still don't know, all the areas that are still puzzled for future research or for personal experimentation in the lives of people. So. Um, I'm curious to ask you, what is what is next in your career? What are the, the questions that are driving you? Um, well, I'm in a stage where uh, I'm getting older despite my best efforts. 
uh, <laughs> and uh, so I want to concentrate on the, the big projects. I think I won't be collecting data as much anymore. Um, that's that's the important. That's the lifeblood of science. But uh, I think it's time let leave that to the next generation. And I want to work at the integrative level and use all the knowledge I've accumulated over the uh, uh, the decades I've been active. So I'm planning to uh, uh, write some more books. Um, uh, the next one, now that the cell phone is done, I'm either going to do an, a meaning of life book, which I wrote one very long ago, early in my career, but there's a lot more information now. And I want to really revisit the topic and how people find meaning in life. Um, free will is a topic that more than touches on self-control and, and that's been much debated and people always seem to like to argue about that. I noticed there have been a number of sort of popular science books saying there's no such thing as free will. And right, right. Sam, Sam Harris being one of them. Yeah, it's time to develop the opposite view and develop a, a, a strong scientific theory uh, of free will. Mm -hmm. And so that would be on the list to do. Uh, cultural change is one of the grand problems in the social sciences. And I thought someday I'd like to write a book on that. Um, right now I'm busy on a reviewing the research literature on uncertainty. It's, it's a big psychological phenomenon and affects people and business nice. and economic things too. Um, it's is that sort of uh, difficult to pull triggered, by, triggered by our current situation? No, no, I've been interested in actually what started with it is uh, Jessica Alquist uh, did her PhD with me uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, she had studies showing that a, a brief experience of uncertainty has an effect like a depletion manipulation. Uh, so that intrigued me because almost all the ways we've studied self-control or willpower issues is by having people exert that in a first task. Uh, but simply going through an uh, experience of uncertainty seems to produce that, and uh, that intrigued us. And we, we couldn't uh, figure out exactly why this effect occurs. Um, and she's now a tenured professor. Uh, but we were talking and said, why don't we really go through and figure out what's the deal with uncertainty? And we don't have a strong theory to start with. We say, let's just read several hundred research articles and try to put it all together afterwards. So I've been working on that. That might might be with the book at some point. So that's anyway, the future for me, I want to tackle some of these big problems and uh, uh, work with smart people and basically rely on the published research literature rather than generating my own data uh, on a much more narrowly focused question. Right. Wonderful. Um, where can people go to learn more about your work? Oh, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. The, uh, um, the Roy Baumeister .com, I think, has a list of my publications. And uh, um, yeah, I'm not hard to find. OK, I will include that link on the show notes so people can uh, follow you and check your new books when they are available. Okay, great. Right. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Baumeister, for your time and for your insight in all these questions. And uh, everyone, uh, until next time, stay disciplined.